and I'll start in two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, here is your meeting chairman, Professor Frank James. Right, welcome to the um, first Shack online seminar. This is very much an experimental uh, um, thing that we're going to try and do uh, monthly uh, during the at least during the emergency and possibly uh, for a bit longer. Um, as it's the first one, uh, I hope we won't have technical issues. We have uh, tried to deal. Frank, turn the screen. Where the next seminar? This is very much an experiment. Not on YouTube. Uh, um, thing that we're going to try and do uh, monthly uh, during the emergency, possibly uh, for a bit longer. Um, okay. Uh, as I said, I hope we won't have too many technical technical problems. I think I think I've uh, fixed that one. Um, what we'll do is uh, I'll introduce uh, Tim Fulford in a minute, but just to say um, that we would like some feedback uh, on how this has gone, um, uh, what we did right, what we did wrong, whether we're doing this at the right sort of time of day, the right sort of day, that sort of information. Uh, would be uh, very uh, useful indeed, and I'll also mention that uh, later on. Um, I would like to uh, now introduce um, Professor Tim Fulford, who's Professor of English at the Montford University. Um, he's worked extensively on Coleridge, and when you work on Coleridge, you very quickly realise that Coleridge is very interested in, in science, knew quite a lot of the scientific community in the late 18th, uh, early 19th. Uh, century and Tim has made a specialty uh, of looking at the relationship uh, between science and literature in that time. So not only in Coleridge, but he also worked on the correspondence of Joseph Banks, and has just and has co-edited the recently published Letters of Humphrey Davy in four volumes, now available from Oxford University Press at a very reasonable, reasonable cost. Um, and. Having got the letter editing bug, he's continuing and he's now working on uh, Thomas Beddoes, who was uh, Davy's mentor uh, in Bristol when Davy was in his early 20s. And so I'll just hand over to Tim to talk about uh, Davy, his letters, and what we can learn from them. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, hello, everybody. Having got the letter editing bug, he's continuing. Uh, and he's now are we up and running? Hello, everybody. I'm Tim Fulford, and uh, thanks very much for having me. We all okay? Uh, I'm delighted to be invited to Shack. Thanks, Frank, for inviting me. And I'll begin by uh, showing you a copy of the volumes that we're all going to talk about today. Here we are. It's the Oxford uh, edition that's just come out. I'm going to give you a little overview of it. And then after I've described in a fair amount of detail, Uh, what goes on in it. Uh, then I'll look at some particular highlights and, and letters with you in detail. So the letters of Humphrey Davy, this is the first uh, scholarly edition there has ever been of the 1,315 letters. Uh, Rob, could you put the first slide up, please? Just a minute, Tim. We have a number of technical hitches. Right. Uh, somewhere we are broadcasting a. Somebody's got the broadcast on their PC at the same time as they are trying to talk. 
the broadcast lacks the feet lags the pc display by about half a minute so we're all hearing it twice so if you are watching the thing on youtube please turn it off which will try and give your presentation the second thing is tim i'm having a slight problem getting powerpoint to work here we go Just talk among yourselves. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to reload it, I'm afraid. Right. Right, we're off. Okay, shall I begin again? Okay, we're now broadcasting your first slide. Good. Uh, let me begin. Sorry about that. Uh, not to worry. Uh, let me begin again. And um, thank Shaq for inviting me to do this uh, talk. And hope we won't be quite as dogged by technical hitches as we go on. Um, and to say briefly that uh, this is the first scholarly edition of the letters of Sir Humphrey Davy that I, as you can see from this screen, uh, have edited with Sharon Rustin. Uh, it's the work of 11 years. We began in 2009 with a bequest from the uh, veteran uh, Davy scholar, uh, June Fulmer, who left uh, an incomplete manuscript of uh, uh, typescript of some of the letters, an edition she worked on but didn't get very far with before she died. We're very happy to have been advised on our edition, as you can see, by Jan Galinsky and by Frank James himself and by the late David Knight. Uh, we've dedicated the edition uh, to June Fulmer and to David Knight. David, of course, died uh, whilst we were in the process of preparing it. And we had invaluable assistance from Andrew Lacey. Uh, next slide, please. There he is in 1803 in a painting by Henry Howard. One of the things you can immediately see uh, in that painting about Davy is how young he was, how early in his life he made his major discoveries and made his huge cultural impact. Uh, my title today, The Greatest Chemist uh, That Has Ever Appeared, isn't so much an attempt by me to rate Davy on a scale of masters of science, as to point out the cultural impact that Davy had in his own lifetime. It's a quotation from Ampère, and uh, it does indicate what a sensation his work made across Europe. And one of the reasons for the success of his work across Europe was his uh, correspondence and his exploiting of uh, correspondence networks. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of that now. Um, reminding you of some of the major things that, that Davy achieved and how correspondence played a part in that. And after that overview, I'll show you some highlights of uh, particular letters that illustrate different facets of Davy. 
Well, his letters as a whole, I think, demonstrate that the 18th century republic of letters that enabled savants from across Europe and America to share ideas, something we're familiar with from Joseph Banks's vast correspondence in the 18th century, that this Republic of Letters ju did just about survive the Napoleonic Wars and the blockade of Europe by, uh, by the British Navy. Um, there were ways around this, and that was quite important to Davies' correspondence network. So if we can have the next slide, please, Rob. There is a, a, a manuscript that gives you a chance to see what a typical Davy letter looks like. As you can see, not a particularly uh, neat, but also not a particularly difficult hand to read, which was very fortunate for us. This is a letter to uh, Mark August Pictet, the Genevan uh, man of science from the 22nd of April, 1817. It's not in itself a particularly important letter, but it does indicate one salient fact about Davies' correspondence network and his cultural impact. What you can see here says, my dear sir, I have committed to the charge of Monsieur Delassert for you my last papers on flame. I hope you'll find some results in them not unworthy the notice of the author of the first accurate and philosophical ideas concerning radiant heat. That's picked at himself. I am here with Lady Davy for a little holiday excursion. We return to England in the end of the week, and so on. Over the page, not reproduced here, Davy remarks, the Bibliothèque Universelle is much read in England, and I hope will be more read as it is more known. This letter is a, a snippet from, uh, that reveals the importance of Geneva in Davy's uh, cultural impact in Europe. As you know, France was closed to British men of science for most of uh, Davy's career. But Geneva had this anomalous status. It had been annexed by France, but was not recognized as French by the British. So Genevans could both travel through France as other foreigners could not, but could also travel in England. And uh, Davy developed many scientific and literary contacts in Geneva, including Madame de Stael, the Constance, uh, de, de Luc, uh, Pictet, and uh, was networked into these people through Marset, who was, of course, in London, and the Haldemans. So this dispersed and travelling network of Genevan uh, savants was something that Davy could take advantage of, and the, uh, the journal, the Bibliothèque Britannique, which then became the Bibliothèque Universelle in its second series, uh, published in translation in French many of uh, Davy's papers, and he took great care to make sure that they had access to his papers. And in that way, he carried on at second hand a uh, conversation with uh, the, the French chemists of the period. As a whole, Davy's correspondence shows that a reliable and speedy postal service facilitated newer networks within Britain as well as that across Europe. In 1799 and 1800, Davy was able to pursue his major early work in Bristol on the medical efficacy of newly isolated gases, including famously nitrous oxide, because he could seek and receive advice from James Watt Senior in Birmingham. In 1800 and 1801, he was able to exchange philosophical and poetic ideas with Wordsworth and Coleridge in the remote Lake District with reliability and uh, letters just taking a few days to get from the Lake District down to Bristol. Letters from Scotland, Ireland and England's West Country helped Davy contribute to the chemistry of agriculture and tanning from 1803 to six. By then he had moved to the Royal Institution in London. These letters were also an important element in the development of the nascent discipline of geology. Davy shared field observations by letter and he sent mineral samples through the post, assembling a, mineralog a mineralogical collection at the Royal Institution. And he gave in 1805, annually till 1811, the first lecture series solely dedicated to the subject of geology. These lectures intervened in the debate about the formation and age of the earth between followers of Abraham Werner and proponents of James Hutton's Plutonist explanation. 
In 1808, Davy became a founder member of the Geological Society of London. His letter on the subject reveals how informal correspondence cemented the metropolitan social circles in which much scientific discussion took place. So I don't have a slide of this letter, but I'm going to read you some of it. This is Humphrey Davy to George Bellis Greenough, who of course was another founder of the uh, Geological Society of London and became its president. Uh, Davy and Greenough had known each other since uh, 1800, 1801, introduced via Coleridge. Dear Greenough, Davy says, the necessity of my of getting my account of the new facts ready to be read before the Royal Society will prevent me from breakfasting with our excellent friend Phillips tomorrow and from attending his meeting of geophilists. I hope you will form some plan for evening meetings, that is dinner meetings. The chills of November mornings are very unfavorable to order in pursuit of science. And I conceive we should all think better and talk better after experiencing the effects of roast beef and wine than in preparing for tea, coffee and buttered buns. Cannot a meet dinner meeting at some central tavern be arranged for our general dispositions within the next fortnight. I shall enclose a very imperfect sketch of something about rocks. It is a mere skeleton and I hope you and the rest of our friends will give it muscle, fat and blood and above all nerve and life. This is quite characteristic of the letters of Davy's earlier years, informal, chatty, uh, amusing, the letter of a friend, and quite a clubbable letter. He is planning here with a number of friends he's known for a while, uh, another meeting of a new club. He was in several such clubs, dining clubs, uh, that discussed chemical matters, for instance. So he became a member of the Royal Society Club. Here, he conceives the Geological Society as such a club, convivial gentlemen dining and having scientific discussion. Of course, it became something more formal than that. And uh, as it did so, uh, incurred the disapproval of Joseph Banks. But what this indicates about Davy is there's an overflow from informal, clubbable, men about town conversation, uh, meetings in, in taverns to uh, rather more significant and formal scientific enterprises. He was a clubbable and convivial young man. Davy's most significant achievements owed much to letters received and sent. The popular stereotype of Davy has often been very much in accordance with his own discourse introductory in 1802, where he portrayed the man of science as a lone discoverer operating on nature with powerful instruments. Um, in fact, behind that stereotypical image of the lone genius, Davy was a collaborator and many of his important discoveries owed a lot to his capacity to inspire loyalty and uh, gain help from other men of science. So for instance, uh, his uh, correspondence with Ampere turned out to be particularly useful to him. It led him to a train of experiments on the basis of which he asserted chlorine's elemental nature and the importance of in reactions, 1810 to 11, overturning the prevailing theory of Lavoisier, under which chemistry had been systematized since the 1780s. Davy was then knighted and married 1812. In 1813, he traveled to France to receive an award for his contributions to chemistry. So his ability to collaborate, albeit at a distance via letter with people such as Ampère led to this uh, award, this Napoleonic award. And whilst he was in Paris in 1813, further hints from Ampère led to his identifying a newly discovered substance as an element. He named it iodine. Davy then journeyed to Geneva and to Italy, returning to Britain in 1815. And I'll show you a little bit later uh, a letter to Davy from Ampere, uh, to Ampere acknowledging the help that Ampere was giving him. From autumn 1815 to 1817, 
Davy was able to keep in constant touch with supporters in the northern coal fields, Durham, whilst developing a miner's safety lamp in the laboratory of the Royal Institution and in London. Not only letters, but flasks of fire damp and model lamps went back and forth. So did newspaper cuttings and drafts of articles, as Davy defended his priority against the advocates of George Stevenson as the inventor of the first safety lamp. And he defended himself in the newspapers. Davy's private correspondence network helped him conduct this campaign to have his priority recognized. He won the press campaign in the end. And in 1819, he was made a baronet. With the prestige this award conferred upon him, he was able to negotiate with the foreign secretary to gain government support for his efforts in Naples to unroll the Roman papyri that had recently been excavated at Herculaneum. This was in 1819 and 20. We see that letters were vital campaigning tools again in 1820 when Davy sought election to the presidency of the Royal Society. He used correspondence to marshal allies and thus to outflank his less competitive rivals for the position. Once elected as PRS, much of his correspondence became official as he was also an ex officio commissioner of the Board of Longitude and a trustee of the British Museum. Letters to the Admiralty and from the Admiralty resulted in his attempting the electrochemical protection of the copper sheathing of Royal Navy vessels in 1824 to 25, and also in his advising on Arctic expeditions, 1823 to five. Other letters to government reveal him seeking patronage for science, medals to award to eminent researchers, grants of land for an observatory, and for the Zoological Society, 1825 to 26. Meanwhile, private letters from these years show him developing the careers of John Frederick Herschel and Michael Faraday, albeit with episodes of spleen for which he became notorious in his later years. From early 1827, Davies' correspondence altered character in the wake of the debilitating strokes that forced Davy to quit scientific research and resign the presidency of the Royal Society. He became an invalid seeking the warm climate of Southern Europe in the winter and the relatively cool climate of the uh, Illyrian Alps in the summer. In this period, he became a more intimate and reflective correspondent, writing long letters to his wife and to his old friend, Thomas Poole. These letters show his persistent interest in poetry and in such literary acquaintances as Byron, Coleridge, Maria Edgeworth, Walter Scott, Southey, and William Wordsworth. His last two books, Salmonia of 1828 and 29, and Consolations in Travel, posthumously published in 1830, these two books are shaped by this interest, for they combine poetic evocations of landscape with philosophical dialogues on man's relationship to the world and to its creative and destructive powers. Consolations in Travel was finished in manuscript just before Davy's untimely death at Geneva at the age of 50. Rob, could you move on to slide five, please? And the next. Uh, no, you've gone backwards. Yes, this one. Yeah. So what I'm going to do now in the next section is uh, talk a little bit about one or two particular letters uh, and give you some context for them. Uh, what you're looking at now is a letter to Davy from Coleridge, uh, written October 1800. And this is written from the Lake District. I'll read it out. On this mountain Carrick, at the summit of which are the remains of a vast druid circle of stones. I was wandering when a thick cloud came on and wrapped me in such darkness that I could not see 10 yards before me. And with the cloud, a storm of wind and hail, the like of which I had never before seen and felt. The wind became so fearful and tyrannous that I was apprehensive some of the stones might topple down upon me. 
So I groped my way further down and came to three rocks placed in this wise. Coleridge includes a sketch in the original letter. Supported, each supported by the other like a child's house of cards. And in the hollow and scream which they made, I sat for a long while sheltered as if I'd been in my own study, which I, in which I'm now writing. Here I sat with the total feeling worshiping the power and eternal link of energy. The darkness vanished as by enchantment, far off, far, far off to the south, the mountains of Glaramara and Great Gabal and their family appeared distinct in deepest sablest blue. I rose and behind me was a rainbow bright as the brightest. I descended by the side of a torrent and passed or rather crawled, for I was forced to descend on all fours by many a naked waterfall till fatigued and hungry and with one finger almost broken, which remained swelled to the size of two fingers, I reached the narrow vale and the single house nested in ashes and sycamores. Now this letter, if one reads it in full, is not simply a description of a walk. It's also Coleridge attempting to renew with Davy a language that they had shared in person, in common, in Bristol, when Coleridge had returned to uh, Bristol and first met Davy in 1799. They'd shared then an enthusiastic language, which is very much the hallmark of the circle of poets, intellectuals and men of science, drawn together in Bristol by their common, their mutual mentor, Thomas Beddoes, uh, the uh, organizer and founder of the uh, Bristol Medical Pneumatic Institution where Davy was first hired. And where of course, as is famously known, Davy administered nitrous oxide. And this group of uh, young men, very much inspired by Beddoes' example, which was that of enthusiastic uh, attempts to create new cures for diseases such as consumption and even cancer uh, generated together uh, an enthusiastic language in which chemistry and poetry were two complementary ways of exploring the nature of the relationship between the body, the mind and the world beyond them. With the idea of get the newly isolated gases and their effect within the body and on the mind being the key element. If you move on a slide now, please, Rob. David's reply shows how he continued to maintain this enthusiastic shared language kind of in language, if you like, um, from a distance with Coleridge. You'll pardon my long epistolary indolence when you are acquainted with the causes of it. Often within the last three weeks as my hand directed by love, begotten thoughts, seized the instrument of distant communion to tell you that it was connected without real organs living in pain and with ideal organs, only living in pleasure when contemplating you and some other ideal aggregates. As often has that instrument been snatched away by devils in the form of gas wonder hunters, spectre experiments and sicknesses of the stomach. The literal meaning of this is that during the last three weeks, I've, sometimes, I've been sometimes busy and often ailing with a complaint of the stomach. Till the day before yesterday, I was only ailing, but then, next slide, please. I became ill for eight and 30 hours. I experienced pain in the various forms of headache, chills, heats and nausea. I'm now better, but my head swims a little. Oh, that the organizer of the universe pleasurable sensation or love would give to impressions exactly the same laws of motion as it has given to ideas. Then should my torpid organs that now rest confined in a prison of civilization, i.e. a house, be where their ideas are with you wandering over majestic mountains cooled by the breezes of health or sleeping upon brown leaves beneath the unclouded heaven or floating on lakes colored by the suns of evening. I won't read out the next paragraph. You might want to look at that later. What it suggests is that there were medical applications of this language that 
Coleridge and Davy were sharing. Coleridge wanted Davy to provide a prescription. Uh, to look at the last paragraph we have on the page here, Davy says, I shall be anxious to hear that you have begun your treatise on the elements of poetry. You are to be the Talibur of the demons existing in the world of language, the root out of all the weeds and unnatural plants that the hand of civilized man has sown in the Eden of passion and nature. I regret that Christabel is not to be published in the lyrical ballads. It is, however, a regret of self-interest arising from the wish that the first part had induced for the perusal and reperusal of the whole. I have made some important galvanic discoveries, which seem to lead to the door of the temple of the mysterious God of life. I shall sometime within the next six months publish a work upon this subject. So what we see here in this exchange of letters is that the enthusiastic language that they share about nature is very much to do with pneumatic chemistry and pneumatic medicine. The idea that breathing in free air, free breezes, rather than the confined air in which of the hot wells, where Davy's writing this, will invigorate the body. Chemical changes within the body absorbed in the Darwinian sensorium will produce changes of ideas in the mind. So invigorate the body, but also revitalize the mind. There is in this correspondence, the millenarian hope for a new world. This is a post French revolutionary enthusiasm, whereby you hope to not just induce a new era of improved bodily health, but also a new era of improved thinking. Everyone will be more enlightened as we work out how best to breathe in the right kind of gases in the right proportions rather than suffer from pollution and torpid air. And Coleridge is quoting Davy's own poetry back to him in his letter and then Davy returns Coleridge's enthusiastic writing in kind. You can see from the end of Davy's letter that Coleridge's poetry is conceived of as part of this inquiry into uh, an improved and changed nature, a uh, relationship between man and the world, and that he sees his own galvanic experiments, these are the early experiments he's making in Bristol with the voltaic pile, as equally offering to lift the veil, allow entry into the temple of the mysterious God of life. Now, Davy and Coleridge were very much criticized for this by conservatives, the anti-Jacobin review, offered a number of parodies of these millenarian hopes and suggested that they were working themselves up into an exhilarated and unrealistic uh, hope for a, a new world. Uh, it saw them as dangerous radicals and also slightly absurd. And Davy himself, I think, looked back on this kind of language as being too enthusiastic. But what you can see from his correspondence is that Without this kind of network of correspondence, sharing this enthusiastic language, it would have been very hard for Davy to innovate at all. Um, certain suspension of the critical faculties of the cynical views of conservatives about human nature was actually necessary for new possibilities to be embraced. And while not all of those possibilities led anywhere, uh, Beddoes became notorious for becoming too enthusiastic about his uh, researches and their anticipated results. Some of them did, uh, and Davy was able to establish methods by which he could distinguish between the new ideas that would just be that, ideas, and those which would could be tested by experiment and, and would actually work. And so his Bristol phase of enthusiasm carried on by correspondence when some of those left Bristol, which you can see here, was actually key to his uh, early discoveries. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. This is uh, a letter written by Davy from London, from the Royal Institution, where he was then living. Whoops, uh, we've gone backwards again. There we are. Uh, no, yes, that's what we want. 
And this is written to uh, John King, Johann Koenig, a Swiss uh, emigrant to Bristol who became surgeon in Bristol and uh, who married uh, the sister of the woman that Beddoes had married. So we see here that King is part of the Beddoes circle and Davy is writing back to him having left the Beddoes circle, writing back to him from London. This letter tells us about early days at the Royal Institution. And you can see again that this enthusiastic language about pneumatic chemistry is still present and Davy is still using it as a way to renew his friendship. Nature is beautiful and you are in her bosom that the voice of comfort which speaks in the breezes of morning may visit your mind, that the delightful influences which the green leaves, the blue sky, the moonbeams and the clouds of the evening diffuse over nature, the universe, may in their powers of soul healing visit your day visions and your night visions is my desire and my hope. You were long silent and I have been long silent. The voice of fame is still murmuring in my ears. My mind has been excited by the unexpected plaudits of the multitude, I dream of greatness and utility. I dream of science restoring to nature what luxury, what civilization have stolen from her. Pure hearts, the forms of angels, bosoms beautiful and panting with joy and hope. My labors are finished for the season as to public experimenting and public enunciation. My last lecture was on Saturday evening. Nearly 500 persons attended. And among other philosophers, your countryman, Professor Pictet, there was respiration, nitrous oxide, and unbounded applause. Amen. Tomorrow, a party of philosophers meet at the institution to inhale the joy-inspiring gas. It has produced a great sensation. Sa ira. Dr. Garnet has resigned, and at this moment, I am the only lecturer. I hope they will get some professor of mechanics. Before he resigned, I was made sole lecturer on chemistry. I've been nobly treated by the managers. God bless us, I'm about a million times as much a being of my own volition as at Bristol. And if you just move on a slide, please, Rob. This is Gil Ray's uh, famous caricature, which many of you may know already, of this demonstration of breathing nitrous oxide before a number of the distinguished philosophers of the day. Davy is there working the bellows and that's either Young or Garnet holding the nose of the person who's breathing in and then in Gilray's depiction farting out the new gas. Among those in the audience is Rumford standing by the door on the right, the back, uh, and Banks, stout and white-haired in the foreground. Uh, so a satirical picture of uh, Davy's enthusiastic portrait. If you just go back one slide to the letter again, please. You can see here something of Davy's excitement at this unexpected and very fast public impact that he's achieved in London. Nearly 500 persons attended. Uh, Forms of angels, bosoms beautiful, reminds us that Davy became a sensation amongst the intellectual women of London uh, who flocked to hear him lecture at the Royal Institution. He made his name as a lecturer before he made his most famous scientific, scientific discoveries and isolation of new elements. Uh, so he's brought Bristol science with him to the Royal Institution here. This is breathing in nitrous oxide uh, to great public acclaim rather than experimenting with the voltaic pile, uh, which he was doing behind the scenes rather than in public lectures and which would come to the fore later in public lectures. Um, so it, one of the other things that's notable in this letter too is that phrase sa ira. It has produced a great sensation, sa ira. That's the in phrase of the French revolutionary song. So if you're uttering that, you're identifying yourself, at least jovially with a friend as an enthusiast still for the French revolution. Um, and it's that sense of revolutionary and radical enthusiasm that, that Gilroy partly is poking fun at in his slide and that Davy learned to drop fairly rapidly in London in what was a conservative scientific milieu presided over by Banks. 
at the Royal Society and also to some extent at the Royal Institution, he remodeled himself as he turned away from breathing in exhilarating gases. And he also remodeled himself in terms of his, the, the politics of his scientific discourse to make it clear he was not associated any longer with revolutionary causes or ideas. Let's move on one and we'll look at one more slide, I think, before I draw to a close. And another one. Yes, this one. Daily to Ampere, um, much later. Uh, and this is evidence in the correspondence of uh, Davy's ability, at least before his marriage in 1812, Davy's ability to form connections through correspondence with others and to be, uh, to inspire enough loyalty for correspondence such as Ampere to offer him hints and suggestions, which he then developed. The same thing happened with Berzelius. He did not always in later years repay men such as Ampere and Berzelius with generosity, but at least earlier, he was generous enough in his acknowledgements for them to want to help uh, so that they had the ability to foster someone they saw as a genius. And Davy, in other words, worked hard at being fostered. I thank you very sincerely for the letter you were so good as to send to me. And that letter is reproduced in Ampere's correspondence. The sentiments it contained were highly flattering to me and the views very instructive. You have pointed out the analogies between the fluoric and muriatic gases in masterly manner, I know of, but one objection to the views you propose, this is that potash seems to be formed by burning potassium in silicated fluoric gas, which seems to imply that there is some substance in which, in it, which contains oxygen. I shall take the liberty of sending with this note my last paper on oxymuriatic gas, receive it as a proof of my high extent esteem. So correspondence is working here as a way of acknowledging gifts, uh, sending further gifts and thereby cementing uh, friendly scientific relationships uh, on a private basis. Uh, and if you move on a slide now, Rob, this is one of our footnotes to that letter showing how Davy moved on from his initial reply to Ampere in the letter that I've just read and uh, carried out new researches as a result of Ampere's hints, which uh, led to his isolating uh, fluorine as a element. I won't comment in detail on that now. I'll leave you to have a look at that and perhaps to replay it later. There's a lot more I could say, but I think I've spoken for 35 minutes or so, and I suggest perhaps that's a, a good time to, to have a break from that and to go to some questions or further discussions. Frank, over to you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jim. I don't quite know why Frank's not talking. I can't get him to work. Oh, yeah. Can you unmute yourself, Frank? Is that better? Yes. Brilliant. Oh, right. Don't know what's happened there. I think it crashing up on me on my desk. So thank, thank you, Tim. That was that was really super. Um, so what we'll do is I will ask a first question and then feed in other questions that come come in from either the um, uh, Ambix, uh, the meetings at ambix.org. So anyone's got any questions, just sort of email them to there or use the um, uh, chat facility um, on 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 YouTube and hopefully they will get to me in some sort of way. Uh, so just to sort of get things going, Tim, could I sort of ask, 
continue in this sort of political switch that Davy does probably in, within the first three or four years of his arriving in London, um, he still retains these enormous audiences. I mean, these very, very enthusiastic audiences of aristocrats, conservatives, uh, two thirds of whom seem to be uh, women. Um, and although he moves away from the sort of radical Bristol rhetoric, as you say, uh, there must be something in the sort of way he performs and the language that he uses that retains that audience, um, even though he's not sort of giving quite the same message as he gave when he arrived in 1801. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. He was clearly, um, if you look at the the text of his geological lectures, for instance, that we uh, we have from 1805, we can see that he frequently offers inspiring visions of the future of science as a way of decoding the world, uh, the history of the earth in, in geology uh, and chemistry too. So that for general audiences, as well as spectacular demonstrations, a number of which he devised for his chemical lectures, and really fine illustrations, which he used in his geological uh, lectures, transparencies, for instance, uh, which perhaps worked um, just as well as a Zoom meeting does today. Um, as well as that, he uh, was able to inspire a general audience who were not going to follow the, the detailed chemical work that he was doing in the laboratory uh, with noble visions of science and uh, what is suggested about civilization and the advance of humanity. And it was those, those sorts of visions, I think, and it must've been something about his particular delivery as well, the way he spoke, his, his body language, that made him a bit of a sex symbol in London, uh, the Royal Institution. Whilst at the same time, he maintained through private correspondence, a very clubbable, affectionate series of relationships with uh, with young men of his own class, uh, that with Marset, for instance, was a typical example, and with Alan and children, uh, other men of his age and class who carried out chem chemical experimentation. He socialized with them. And yet at the same time as doing that, he was also very diligent in operating uh, a language that allowed him to be patronized by Joseph Banks. He was efficacious in doing what Banks wanted him to do. He made himself reliable. He worked out what language to adopt with, with Banks to retain Banks's favor and to benefit from his patronage. Um, so I think for all those reasons, he was very good at operating as it were on several related fronts and with several related discourses that all adduced to his own advancement and to the advancement of his own work. Okay, so I think Hasek Chang's got a sort of similar, a, a related question, um, and I'll, I'll read it out. Um, during Davies' establishment, that's an in inverted commas, phrase in London, does his private correspondent reveal any of his enthusiast and romanticist self while he suppressed it in public, as you, as you mentioned? Yes, I think one of the ways that that works is, um, Correspondence with the, the people I've just been talking about, uh, men of his own class and age. So it's not so much Coleridge and Southey and King anymore, or King Lake. He moves away to some degree, at least, from his Bristol uh, acquaintances, but they are replaced by young men who he knows in London. And the enthusiasm for nature that he shares with them uh, occurs in letters where he's planning excursions, geological field trips that, that occupy much of the summers of 1805, 1806, um, angling excursions. Uh, and these tend to go on with uh, fellow young men of science. And it's clear that relationships are forged outdoors in nature, social relationships, but that also ideas for carrying out experiments uh, take place in that milieu and the letters set up these occasions. Yeah, I mean, one of the things one does learn when doing, working on Davies about the history of fishing, I mean, it's sort of quite remarkable how many <laughs> his letters deal with fishing. Um, the next question is from Alison McManus, McManus sorry. 
Um, how actively did David recruit support from his correspondence network during priority disputes? How did his contacts display their own initiative? Well, thank you for that question. That was an aspect of my talk I didn't actually have time to get onto just now. Um, absolutely assiduous in his uh, recruitment of those people who were already his private allies. Uh, and the most important thing I think about the safety lamp priority dispute that, that makes it perhaps a little different to many others of earlier periods is that it takes place uh, not just in and around the Royal Society or not just in pamphlet wars, privately printed and circulated pamphlets, but actually in the newspapers, it becomes a cause celebre in public in the way that say uh, Johnny Depp's uh, libel trial is at the moment. All sorts of people are fascinated to read about this in their daily newspaper. And um, what Davy did in order to counteract stories and squibs and satires about him that were placed in the Newcastle papers by the advocates of George Stevenson was use his correspondence up there in Newcastle to uh, counteract these squibs and satires with uh, short articles and letters that they would place in those newspapers up there in Newcastle, while well, simultaneously uh, as the priority disputes spiralled out of control and became more and more bitter, in the end he called in the big guns, Davy, and he had Banks, uh, Brand, Hatchet, Young, all sign a declaration uh, that they drafted together uh, in which they asserted Davy's priority and uh, its scientific basis. And uh, that was inserted in a number of London newspapers, which is an unusual thing for Joseph Banks to, to put his uh, name to, uh, and was fairly conclusive, I think, in most people's eyes, although not necessarily amongst the uh, mine owners of, of the Durham coal field, many of whom uh, continued to employ Stevenson lamps. But in general public opinion, being able to wield in public uh, those people he had privately cultivated to wheel out the big, the big names in, in London establishment science uh, was conclusive for Davy. Yeah, that was the audience Davy that mattered to Davy after, after all, I think one has to say. Um, mm. Okay, Brigitte Stenhouse, um, did Jane Davy uh, take an active role in building stroke utilizing the Davy correspondence network? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch all of that, Frank. Sorry. Did Jane Davy what? Did Jane Davy take an active role in building, stroke, utilising the Davy Correspondence Network? That's an interesting question. It's hard to see from the uh, the correspondence that survives that she did so for much of the time. I think that what we can see between the lines of the letters that Davy's letters that survive is that Jane Davy was extremely good at being a society hostess, uh, particularly amongst literary circles. Walter Scott called her the greatest lion catcher he had uh, ever encountered. And so I think she did use Davy's fame as a way to help draw to her salon uh, a number of the uh, intellectuals and literary figures of Europe with whom she otherwise would have had not very much status. So she cultivated the de Stael's, for instance, when Madame de Stael came over to London. And being able to meet Davy, I'm sure, was a prize that, that, that many uh, wanted to have. I imagine Byron would have been rather less keen to attend her salon as he did, had he not had the chance of meeting Davy there. Um, so in that sense, she cultivated, I think, Davy's uh, correspondence, although we don't see her actually writing to them. Those letters don't survive, except in a few cases in later years, in the 1820s, and indeed after Davy's death, where Jane organised introductions for herself to uh, various important figures, princes and dukes in Europe on the basis that she was Davy's widow. I mean, perhaps I could just add a bit there because, I'm, because as you know, I'm actually working on uh, Jane Davy at the moment during this sort of strange lockdown period. And one of the things that comes 
across very, very clearly is just after they get married, um, there's a, there's a, they make a self-conscious effort to bring their two social circles together. It's not just sort of Dave, Jane Davy bringing her social circles to Davy. It's the other way around because they, they, they go on this amazing tour of castles in Scotland and be, and stay with three dukes and one earl in the course of three months, and so and that's all Davy's connections and rather, rather than her connections. So it's a, it's a, it goes both goes both ways. Um, Michael Duress um, asks: Davy abandoned his revolutionary views in London, but coming from the West Country, did he have to adapt socially, manners, accent, etc., or was regional prejudice less widespread than later? Um, it's hard to know at 200 years distance just how much of your regional accents and disposition you had to rub off in the London of 200 years ago. We know, for instance, at the start of the 18th century, that a poet such as James Thompson worked very hard to get rid of his Scotticisms in his accent and manner of speaking in order to be able to be patronised by the English Whig aristocrats who did in the end patronise him. So even then there was quite a bit of rubbing off of your regionalisms that you needed to do. Um, how much there was still in 1800 isn't totally clear, but it's clear that Davies, as a, as, as a very youthful lecturer, that Davies' unusual Cornish inflected accent was part of his attractiveness, part of his novelty in London. It's also clear that by the 1820s, uh, Davies' attempts to appear metropolitan and of a higher class than he was met cynical snobbery by a number of people who resented him and his social climbing for various other reasons. They resented his power seeking. And then it became for such people easy to point to the lack of grace with which Davy uh, conducted himself in public. Not so much the, the way he retained a Cornish accent, but that he didn't really sit well in the aristocratic uh, clothes that he wore and manners that he tried to adopt. They, they seemed put on. Yeah, I go along with that. Um, I, I've just realised that one of the sort of weaknesses of this is that we don't seem to have any sort of feedback mechanism. And I think we've sort of chance mm -hmm. to do in, in future. So apologies if, to those who've asked questions and I uh, you can't come back at the, uh, at the discussion. Uh, Bill Jenkins asks, as a romantic natural philosopher, how did David perceive the connection between poetic fancy and the scientific imagination? Well, there's a brief question for an afternoon. <laughs> um, I think it varied at varied times. I'll try and give a rapid answer to what's a very complex question. Um, I think I was trying to say that in the 1790s, Davies intellectual formation was very much in this culture produced in the Beddoes circle in which uh, it was a materialist understanding of, of mind uh, and the idea was that by uh, understanding what and how we breathed in and how oxygen was combined in the body, uh, we might actually be able to not only understand physiology, but also improve it and improve mental capacity that we could actually create an enlightened mental world. And so ways of experimenting with and thinking through the relationship of man to nature uh, became something you could do in poetry and in chemistry. So from that period, what's quite telling is a, a letter that Davy writes after reading Wordsworth's famous poem, Tintin Abbey, in which Wordsworth imagines himself suspended and lulled by the breezes of the valley and falling into a trance in which in that trance, he's able to think differently to absorb and enter a different relationship with the world in that trance. He then tries to revive the trance in later years as he remembers it in writing the poem. After reading this, Davy himself went to Tintin uh, in order to respond to landscape in an analogous manner to that in which Wordsworth had responded to it. But he also took with him a eudiometer to try to actually measure the proportion of oxygen in the air at different places in, in the valley as it were to see if he could by chemical analysis demonstrate that there was what was in the physicality of this mental change that the valley brought about. 
So that was one sort of specific answer. Uh, and another answer that I'm starting to work on is that it looks like there, there are a number of places in David's lectures where he suggests that entertaining possibilities that can't necessarily be proved or aren't susceptible of proof by experiment is nevertheless a very useful thing for the man of science to do uh, as a sort of mental gymnast, gymnastics, if you like. And that that ability to entertain a number of different possibilities and rapid combinations and alter those combinations mentally gives you the mental flexibility to actually entertain different scientific ideas or even to design and redesign experiments as you go along so that in the end they do demonstrate something about nature. So he advocates for men of science that they should uh, perform such tasks and he sees imaginative writing, reading it and also writing it as one of the ways in which you can entertain a rapid series of different combinations. So I think that he sees there to be in certain respects methodological similarities between let's say designing and redesigning experimental possibilities on the one hand and drafting and redrafting poetry for instance on the other hand where poetry involves constant alterations of, of a number of complex alternatives as you manipulate rhyme meter sense and sound and you know there are a number of places in his notebooks where he is thinking scientifically uh, and also at the same time jotting down drafts of poetry okay and so I think one last question um, from Chris Campbell. Uh, does the correspondence reveal anything of Coleridge's view on how the study of chemistry impacted on Davy's poetry? Does it reveal any of Coleridge's view? Um, well, probably the best place to look for that is uh, Coleridge's correspondence. Um, so if you read Davies and Coleridge's correspondence together, what survives of it, since neither of them was very good at keeping the other's letters, um, you can see uh, Coleridge suggestions to Davy about his verse, making detailed suggestions for revision. Uh, and the verse in question is what Davy called spinozistic, it's pantheist. So it's not directly about chemical experimentation, but it is setting out a, a philosophy uh, uh, about the nature of nature uh, within which Davy was operating and making his chemical inquiries. And Davy then responds by uh, adopting and, and rejecting some of those suggestions for revision. So uh, it, I think the answer to the question is it's what we might see loosely is a philosophy within which chemical experiment, a philosophy of nature and within which chemical experimentation is done by Davy it is very much shaped by the interchange of correspondence with, with Coleridge. And I think that's a very nice point on which to end uh, the discussion and the talk just on the sort of impact of correspondence um, on poetry, on science and experimentation and so on. Uh, so um, I'll just sort of wrap up. Um, as I said at the beginning, if you've got any feedback on how this has gone, um, or the sort of time timings we've used, or the time of the session and or day of the session, please do email meetings at ambix.org. Um, we the next speaker will be in this is we Jenny Rampling at some point in September, but until we've got the feedback. Uh, we're, we're not sort of going to pin down a precise, uh, precise date, so it's quite important that we know that we've hit the right sort of time and um, day. Um, this talk and discussion will get, has been recorded and will go up on YouTube um, in what we're calling the Shack Channel. Shack Channel was just one thing, but we're going to sort of improve that, improve that as time, uh, time goes on. And so it just remains for me to thank the rest of the team um, who've been involved in uh, delivering this. That's Rob Johnson, Anna Simons, uh, Caroline Cobble, Chris Campbell, and Becky Martin. Uh, and, of, and of course, uh, our speaker, Tim Fulford. Now, I should have recorded a test match 
clapping session because I'm not quite sure how you do clapping on Zoom. But Tim, please assume that everybody is clapping. And so thank you so much for give, giving this initial talk. Thank you all for having me. Very enjoyable. OK. Good luck. Thank you very much.